Hi everyone, welcome. Welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields. This is going to be a very personal, heartfelt message from my heart. We know if we've repented that God has forgiven us. That's a given, isn't it? It's, it's a secure, sacred belief we have. But what about the one thing our Savior says will cause our Father to say he can't forgive us? The one thing that will keep his forgiveness away if we don't do it. Mark 11, verses 25 to 26. Mark 11, 25 to 26. Yeshua says this. Whenever you stand praying, I guess you can stand praying in public areas. They stood, of course. If you have anything against anyone, please let that sink in. If you have anything against anyone, has that sunk in? If you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespass, trespasses. But if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I think we've all, we all would say, you know what, I've forgiven a lot of people, a lot of times, thousands of times. Lots and lots of situations. But Christ here is saying if you have anything against anyone and haven't forgiven that slander, that hurt, that offense, that awful adultery against someone in your family, or even death caused by some stupid act someone did, getting drunk or whatever. What about really personal, painful, awful, awful things like that? Maybe slander and gossip that ruined you in the eyes of so many people. Who is it, the anyone, that you have something against? Who is it that you could be holding a grudge against? Think, is it your ex, your ex-husband, your ex-wife, your ex-boss, your ex-minister, your friend, your ex-friend, your friend who had sex with your daughter or your wife, a minister who humiliated you in church? Who? Your dad, your mom, one of your kids, all of your kids, brother, sister, someone in church? A neighbor? Your boss? Who? Because I think most of us, if we're really honest, will find there's someone out there we need to go before God and repent for and, and, and the fact that we haven't forgiven them and ask for their forgiveness or forgive them if they've offended against us. Surely we won't make Jesus say this over and over again before we believe it. But in this case, he, sa he does say over and over in various ways. It won't happen. We won't be forgiven if we don't forgive others. One of one or two of you are out there hearing this thinking, hey, what a big deal. There's no big deal. I don't have anybody. I have no enemies. There's no one I need to forgive or has something against me. That may be true for one or two of you. It's hard for me to believe that, but it's maybe true. But believe me, in the coming years, you will be tested and tested and tested on this. Rough times are coming. Do you all know the name Corey Tenboom? She and her sister were concentration camp inmates. And she wrote a book called The Hiding Place. She had to forgive. And she had to find faith in the most terrible, difficult times. Her sister was killed in the concentration camp. She watched as a Nazi guard banged her sister's head real hard with a shovel. Later on, she met this man as she was speaking in a church area about forgiveness. And this man, this Nazi who had banged his her sister in the head with a shovel, or something like that, came up and said, I'm so glad that I can come and know that you have forgiven me. And it all welled up in her heart and mind right then and there. Can I? And she did. She said it was painful. But we are coming to some hard times. Some of us may not be taken to a place of safety. The latest Sean types, perhaps, or whoever. But even before the protection is given to a place of the final three and a half years. It's going to be rough in the coming years. So we'll be tested on this over and over to forgive as Christ has offered forgiveness to us and to the whole world who accepted, who will accept his offering through his death and resurrection. Corey Ten Boom says, forgiveness is setting the prisoner free. Just to find out, the prisoner was me. Isn't that profound and true? Because lack of forgiveness will bind your bitterness 
will bitterness will bind you in some kind of a prison, a jail. So as you'll see too, true full forgiveness is not just saying, okay, I forgive you. But true forgiveness involves a change of your heart, our heart. All malice and grudges, hurts, hateful, vengeful desires, leave us. This is so important. As much as possible, go for full restoration, full reconciliation, a loving relationship in spite of anything that's happened in the past. You won't find a lot of entire sermons on this one subject from ministers. I don't have a lot. I have one I gave before on forgiving as Christ forgave you, something like that as a pre-Passover sermon, as this is. But I think the reason you don't hear a whole lot of focused sermons on forgiving others that you, that you may be forgiven is because it's messy. Messy in that ministers know people, maybe ourselves, our wife, our husband, maybe one of our children, maybe someone we're very close to who is having a real tough time forgiving others. You know it, and you'd rather not stir this topic up, just like you won't hear a lot of sermons on divorce or on the role of man and woman in marriage. We know people, we just don't want to stir the pot in something that's controversial. We know people out there who haven't forgiven their ex, their ex-wife, their ex-husband, or people who will not forgive that adulteress who stole away your husband and ruined your life. As we understand, all of that was painful and continues to be. So we just decide not to press the point, the ministers I'm talking about. It's much easier to talk about world events, Russia and the Ukraine, the mark of the beast. Who is the beast? Uh, where is the place of safety? Is there a place of safety? Uh, speculative things like that, rather than Christian living things, which is what I mostly focus on. We ignore it, though, to our own peril, this point of forgiving others totally from our heart. Passover, remember, is coming up real soon. It's in, it's, uh, I'm giving this in the middle of March. 2022, and in mid-April or so, Passover will be here for most of us. Through the shed blood, God's forgiveness through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, will be here soon. And remember this, totally forgiving is painful. Yeshua had to die, had to be beaten, scourged, and shed His blood. He had to be pierced, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There simply is no forgiveness. Life is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11 says. So to totally forgive these people, those really, really bad people in your estimation, is going to hurt at first until you feel that release that I promise you will come if you did it right. It will be hard. It will be painful. It might even cause you to die a little bit. True forgiveness from a changed heart, a heart given to us by God, is painful. Christ's forgiveness cost him his life. But Yeshua and Father thought you were worth it, in spite of all your offenses against God, in spite of all your sins that you've committed and continue to commit once in a while. You were worth the ultimate price. So the cost of forgiving can go all the way to dying a bit. This is so important. There's going to be a lot going on in the news. Don't get distracted with Passover coming on, focus all the more so on Yeshua. So set your eyes, set your mind, set your focus on the author and finisher of our faith. And remember this, if we aren't forgiven by God because we haven't forgiven everybody, especially someone we're very conscious of that we can't stand, forgiven those people from our hearts, every single person who's caused us pain it means, in spite of everything I've said about the cross, about the grace and the favor of God, about Yeshua and our Father and perfection of God that he offers us, that won't happen because we won't be there. We won't have a future. It all comes down to now acting out, redoing from our lives what God has done for us. He's given us grace. We have to give grace. He's given us forgiveness. We have to give forgiveness. He sees us in new light. We have to see others in new light, no matter how bad they've been, and leave the judgment up to God. Remember, 
that even beyond forgiving, God wants us to live in a loving, kind, kind way to each other, no matter what. Mark, or Matthew, I mean, Matthew 5, 23, 24. If you bring a gift to the altar, you have a sacrifice, an altar, a tithe, and there you remember that your brother has something against you. He thinks you've done something wrong to him. Leave your gift. Matthew 5, 23. Leave your gift. Right there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother. First be reconciled. Not just forgiven. Reconciled, if at all possible. And then come and offer your gift. Other verses talk about if possible, live at peace with all people. So in Mark 11, Yeshua says, if you have a problem with someone else, forgive them. In Mark, Matthew 5, 23, 24, it says, if you know your brother has something against you, first be reconciled before continuing on your service to God. Are we beginning to see just how a absolutely serious this is? Turn now to Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18, and there we'll find that in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, it's, we know that it speaks of loving your neighbor as yourself, but did you know what the context was? Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18, You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Old Testament. Don't hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin. Not bear sin because of him. Yeah, go talk to your brother. And um, your brother has done something that's caused you to almost hate him. God says, don't go there. Rebuke him. Do talk to him. And so you don't bear sin because of him. Isn't that interesting the way it's put? You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yehovah. You can't hate. We can't bear a grudge. But work it out best you can. Or you and I could be the one bearing a sin because of him, it says in verse 17, Leviticus 19, 17. Oh, believe me, Jesus isn't done teaching us about how we must do this. In the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, part of it says this, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation or sore trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And then Yeshua immediately hops in and says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, I'll include women in that where it says men, <laughs> mankind, okay? If you do not forgive men, people, their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. There's another one, see? Over and over we're told this. I am sure now that God... If we have failed in forgiving absolutely everyone, I think God will bring that to our attention. If it's important to him, he wants to forgive us. He wants us in his kingdom. So I'm sure that he will bring it to our mind because he doesn't want to bar us from the kingdom. But the scriptures still are clear. I'm just saying that don't panic. I think God loves you enough to make sure you do it. But don't panic. But do get it done. If we want to receive grace, we have to extend grace to other people. It's just that simple. Now, I've struggled in the past with forgiving others. About I'm talking about 15 to 20, 22 years ago, when about four or five people came into my life and did their best to destroy it. Destroy my relationships, my friendships, my reputation, my family. I knew all about these verses on forgiving. But right then, I wanted nothing to do with forgiving them. What they were doing was so bad, so anti-Bible, that surely God understood that I could be angry. I came to loathe them. I came to hate them. I'm talking 20 years ago. Me, an ordained minister. I frankly came to the point where I just wished, I hate to admit this, but I want you to know I understand the subject. Believe me, I do. I frankly came to the point where I just wish they somehow would just die. There, I've said it. I've struggled with this too in the past. I've known all those verses were there. But I thought I had an ace in the hole. 
I believed that they had to repent to me first, come groveling to me, you know. That's what I wanted, have them for, before I had to forgive them. After all, I remember there was a verse that said that, although if you notice, none of the verses I've read so far mentioned that the person causing offense has to repent first. None of them did. But there was an ace in the whole scripture. Aha, so I didn't have to forgive or reconcile unless they repented first. Let's read it, Luke 17, 3 and 4. Luke 17, 3 and 4. Take heed to yourselves. If I'm rushing to the verse real quickly, you guys just print the scriptures off, have them there in front of you, and you can follow along so much better. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. So if you know they've done something, to, to, don't just let it lie. You go talk to him. Say, you know what? I was really embarrassed by what you said in front of all those people at such and such a time. And probably if that person has any of God's spirit, will say, oh, no, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean any hurt. Can you forgive me? I'm so sorry. So Yeshua says, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. But say it, do it privately. Do it you and that person alone, nobody else. That's what Matthew 18, 15, 16 say. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in one day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. This teaching from Messiah comes directly at us from different levels. If we feel offended, we are to talk to the brother or sister, even rebuking them, although we do it privately, Matthew 18, 15. If we're offended, most of us don't feel like talking to that person, but then we must. And then if he repents, we must forgive. And then six more times that same day, he does the same thing or even worse. And six more times he says, I'm sorry, I'm not getting over what I'm coming into or why I'm doing this. Can you forgive me again? Then the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. Seven times in one day. And he says he repents. I have to forgive him. To me, that's saying just forgive. But you and I would decide if someone is offending us seven times in one day, they haven't really repented no matter what they say. They haven't really repented. We're the fruits of repentance. The change. Going the other way. All the things we know repentance mean. Yeshua says, leave that judgment to God. You forgive. So this sermon, this teaching from Christ is not that we just forgive, but learn to get along. Be nice to people. Be kind. Quit losing your temper. Bear with one another. Act towards people 24-7, all the time, the way you would act if you literally could see Yeshua walking beside you day and night, everywhere you went. As you're on that customer service call, you've been waiting 48 minutes so far. As you go to the checkout and something bad happens, and how do you deal with those people? It should be in kindness. I preach to myself, believe me. I've had to apply these too, as I'm naturally an impatient person who once had a hot temper when I was younger. And if customer service wasn't servicing me well, I let him know in the past, sharply, plainly, sometimes loudly. I want that to be the old me. But that's not God's way. It's just not. Our Father's house teaches us not just to forgive, but a possible reconcile. Get along. Be of one mind. Don't just cut people off like so many are subscribing to this notion from boundaries that tells you that, boy, if others aren't really helping you grow and adding to your life, just cut them out of your life. You don't need them. You don't need the aggravation. The Bible says be of one mind. Think of others as better than yourself. Serve their needs, not your own needs. If you want to be great, Yeshua said, become the greatest bond servant of all. You know those scriptures. We'll hear a couple more. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. When we say that idiot, that a, I can't say it on here, 
you know, a bad part of the body. If we call that person a moron or that dummy, that idiot, that's not fulfilling this. In lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. Let each of you look out only, not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. There's a radio station out there we all like to play, WIIFM. What's in it for me? This sermon is not about me and you. It's not about meism, but looking out for everybody. It's not about looking out for number one, unless the number one you mean is God or Christ. The boundaries teaching can be so severe. I've got to give a whole sermon on it sometime, or a blog at least. It's all about you, they say. They tell you you have your own truths, your own mind on things. And if, if, if people are not adding to your life, just cut them out. That's so ungodly. I'm seeing so many Facebook posts that even share these thoughts. that just time to drop people from your life. And my comment to a couple of them was, was basically saying, I'm so glad that when I was being toxic to God, and when you were being toxic to God, and sinning against Him, and not particularly helping Him and His cause, that He didn't just drop us like a hot potato, but came looking for us, the lost sheep. Even after we were baptized, we still weren't perfect. Huh. So the cutting people out of your life, yeah, there are people that you might decide I'm not going to go seeking them to make them a big part of my life, but neither am I going to hate them. I'm going to, when I am around them, I'll be nice to them. I'll talk nicely to them. I'll, I'll, um, I'll be kind. Christ wanted us to be one. In John 17, 22 and 23, at the last Passover that he had the supper, Father, I pray that these may be one in us, in me, as I am in you, as we are one, Father, as you and I are one, may these 11 left here also be one. Christ decried the, the, the divisions. He inspired Paul to say in 1 Corinthians 1.10, he really hated seeing people break up into their own cliques and tribalism, and I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, I'm of Apollos or Barnabas or somebody else. He wanted them speaking the same thing with the same mind and judgment. i got to speak about this boundaries thing soon. I mention that here because it's causing so many people, the boundaries concept, not to forgive, not to rebuild. That's purely from Satan to keep interacting with God wants us to keep interacting with people way beyond just saying you're nice to them. Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14. Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, kindness, 24-7, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Like I said earlier, I'm preaching to myself. I hope you understand that. Bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. Don't just cut them off. Forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Messiah, Christ, forgave you, so you also must do. And above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And I gave a sermon about loving your enemies Let's read the passage again, Matthew 5, 43 to 48 in the NIV this time. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Love your enemies. Pray for the bad guys, <laughs> okay, who causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love just those who love you, so what? What reward will you get? Is that not what the tax collectors do? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that much? Be perfect. Be mature. Be complete, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So our forgiveness has to come to the point where we don't just say we forgive them. 
but that we tell God we forgive them and ask God to bless them, to bless them. If you're doing that, you're doing the right thing. If you're not doing that, you've missed the target so far. Hebrews 12, verses 14 to 15. Release yourself from the bile, the acid of bitterness, the lack of forgiveness. Hebrews 12, 14 to 15. Pursue peace with all people. All people. And holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up may cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So sure, if the offender repents, that would be great, but none of these verses I've read so far speaks of that except Luke 17, 3 and 4. But as I continued my case before God with those that offended me, I began to see God was not smashing us every single time we offend. He overlooked an awful lot of sin by Israel and lots of people. Do you find God castigating Abraham for lying about his half-sister wife and letting her become part of the harem of two leaders? No, God went after the two men and said, don't you dare touch that woman. But there's nothing about God hammering Abraham. Maybe he did. We just don't read it. But I took comfort knowing that they had not confessed or repented to me yet about their sins, so I felt I really maybe didn't have to forgive them. But as I prayed more and more about it, because something was bugging me in my heart, those verses were pretty clear that God won't forgive you if you don't forgive them. You know what thoughts God gave me through his spirit? God's spirit was smiting my heart. So I started praying anew. Yeshua's own example, Jesus' own example, after we humans beat and whipped him, scourged him to within an inch of his life, and then crucified him so painfully and so much in shame, the, 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 the death of the worst of criminals. Yeshua said this later on to the Father as he was hanging there on the cross. This was long before any of the attackers had ever even thought of repenting. Luke 23, 33, 34. Luke 23, verse 33 and 34. When they'd come to the place called Calvary, which is another word meaning skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and one on the left. And Yeshua said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Are you kidding me? This guy's looking like bloody hamburger beaten up, blood flowing from his whole body, ripped off so much skin he could see his bones, Psalm 22 says. Then they, then they divided his garments and cast lots. Had the Roman lictors, the, the, the word they, that's what the, the, the guys who were savaging him with whips, with metal pieces on him. Had they repented? Had they apologized? Had Pilate repented? Had the high priest come and begged forgiveness? No, no, and no. But Jesus forgave them all anyway, before they repented. So don't use that example of you got to wait till they repent. Do you think you're off the hook? You're not. Yeshua also reveals a big point here. The sins of ignorance deserve far more mercy. If someone does something stupidly, unintentionally, without intending to, there's a lot more forgiveness. You'll see that very clearly explained in Numbers 15. Then sins of intention. That's why God was so upset with the killing of Uriah. There's a verse in the Bible that says God, uh, that David was a man after God's own heart and God really loved him deeply and was, you know, except in the one matter. It wasn't the adultery, because that was a sin of temptation. He didn't plan that sin. It, he just didn't fight it enough. It was the sin of killing Uriah, because that was premeditated murder. So just remember how forgiving Jesus was to everyone in his last day, the last 24 hours he had. 
He washed the feet of his betrayer and all the other ones who didn't think of washing his feet. And then in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, as Judas, Judah, was his Hebrew name, Yehuda, as Yehuda came leading the mob with clubs and swords and lances probably, and he kissed Yeshua, Yeshua said to his betrayer, friend, why have you come? Matthew 26, verse 50. Friend, he wasn't lying. Friend. Jesus healed the ear that had been cut off. I think his name was Malchus, one of the guys coming to arrest him. Peter whips out his sword and whacks his, tries to whack his head off, misses, and maybe the guy ducked and got his ear. Instead of saying, well, good riddance to that ear. You guys are coming to hurt me? You can feel a little hurt. No, no. Told Peter, Peter, I could right now call legions of angels, 72,000 angels, 12 legions of angels. They're all around us right now. I can just say angels. And 72,000 would appear. Put your sword away. On that last 24 hours, then by our sins, every man, woman, and child, all of us, we nailed this perfect man to the cross after scourging him first. But his cross just showed him to be a man of love, forgiveness, the Father's love and forgiveness for the whole world and all who crucified him. And then from the cross, he says out loud, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Wow, now that's forgiveness. That's the kind of forgiveness God wants us to have. His worst attackers were the Pharisees and the chief priests, but the one especially bad Pharisee was jailing, killing, beating Christ's family of believers. Yeshua forgave him, though. That was Paul, called Saul or Shaul in Hebrew. And God used him to write most of the New Testament. Boy, what forgiveness. What trust in someone who had been so awful. So another example of forgiving before there was repentance was the story of, of Stephen. You can read that in Acts 7, the end of it, verses 57 to 60. He had explained earlier to the Sanhedrin that Jesus was the Messiah. But in their fury, they proceeded to kill him. They put their hands over their ears, began shouting, Acts 7, verse 57 to 60. They rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city, began to stone him. They took off their jackets so they could throw those rocks even harder. Verse 59, as they, and they left him at the feet of Paul. Saul became Paul. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Don't charge them with this sin. They hadn't repented. They were stoning him. They were stoning him. And yet he was forgiving them. And with that, he died. So don't stay bitter, waiting for those who've offended you to come and repent to you first. There's too many great examples like this. There's the example of Joseph. There's the example of many others I could give. My story, 15 to 20 plus years ago, I had about five people, like I said, coming after me. I was badly hurt. You won't believe the whole story if I would tell you. I felt totally rejected by so many, and they caused so many hundreds of others to reject me as well. Throughout the years, I had hurt many as well leading up to this. I'll admit that. It was just a terribly rotten, painful time for everyone involved. And at first I handled it very badly. For especially four or five that were involved, they got to where I hoped they would even just die. Yep, you heard me right. I, a minister of God, 20 years ago, feeling that badly about people made in God's image. I understand, believe me, how hard it can be to forgive. But God's Spirit was convicting me. The example of Jesus and Stephen shouting on my heart. I wrestled with being able to turn my hate into love, turn my revenge into prayers of blessings for people I couldn't stand. 
I'm sharing this highly charged personal story so you know. I understand how hard it can be to totally forgive from your heart. But praise be to God, he saved me. God did lead me to forgive them from my heart, even in the absence of repentance on their part. I still haven't. But until God did do that, these emotions of bitterness and grudges and boiling up anger, daydreams of how I could get even, you know, frankly just made me, frankly just made me worse and worse, feel worse and worse. Bitterness is a deadly emotional acid so strong it corrodes its own container. You and me, as Corey Ten Boom says. Finally, one day, I finally come to that point. I'd made progress. As I wept, kneeling beside my bed, I could finally say in prayer to Abba in heaven, meaning it, as tears ran down my face. Father, search my heart. You know I now do forgive them. Right now, Father, I feel I would take a bullet for them. I would die for them. If I had to do that to protect or save them, I don't hold any grudges. Forgive me for taking so long, a few years, for being so hard-hearted. Now I ask you to bless, and I started naming them one by one in the areas of blessings they really needed blessings in. I won't go into details here, because it's private. And I said, Father, if we can reconcile, I'm willing. And I'd love to reconcile. Change my heart to one where I fully love these people. As I wrapped up my prayer, just as I said, Amen, the phone rang. I can't go into the exciting details, but the news on the call of the call was exactly related to the topic of my prayer. It was almost like God's way of saying, Philip, my dear son, my dear son, yeah, it took you a while, but I heard, I heard you, and now I can bless you. Philip, welcome to the family. Now that you're extending grace, love, forgiveness, and your heart, your broken heart. I'll give you a new one. Welcome to the kingdom, son. And ever since then, I've had to be on my toes that if I offend someone or someone else offends me, to be quick to reconcile, quick to restore the love. It's not easy because it takes a lot out of you. Forgiving cost the death and the life of Yeshua. So why am I talking about this? Number one. So why do we need the topic? Because if our trespasses are not forgiven by God, we surely have no future. That should be end of why right there. Why do we need it? This is as serious as it gets. We don't want to, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Ministers won't talk about it because it's messy. And because when the offense is so personal, it hurts so bad that it's hard to really forgive from the heart. It's just hard to let go. I have fought this too. Like I've said, those five people, they were hard to forgive. To be honest, I caused others, but not them. Some anguish too. So it took me a while. I'll explain later in the teaching, a little more perhaps. Is there someone you know you need to forgive or reconcile with? Please, prayerfully, listen to this teaching. A couple times if you need to. I wish I had a teaching like this when I was struggling with it. It's the way of the family of God. Extending grace to others who have not been very gracious to you. Okay? We can't say we understand grace. You might know it academically, you guys, but you can't say you understand grace unless you forgive others. We must share this forgiving way as our way of life. God means this. James 2.13 to 14. James 2.13 for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew 5, 7. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. So be a peacemaker, for they, implying only they, will be called children of God. And remember 1 Corinthians 13, the, the love chapter. I'll read that in a minute. 
The kingdom's way is to humbly work things out, forgive, reconcile, make peace, be understanding. So, point number one of why we need it, because we want to be in God's kingdom. We won't be if we don't forgive. Point number two, blessings, blessing our enemies, forgiving those who offend us, reconciling as much as we can, is the kingdom way, is the Father's way. That's the way it is in the kingdom of God. If we're going to be there, we have to be part of that way right now. Did you know that Apostle Paul and Barnabas, uh, they went on early missionary journeys, and they took along a young man named Mark. Yeah, the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark. But in that journey, for whatever reason, Mark quits on him and goes back home. That really upset Paul. So now... Acts 15, after the big conference in Jerusalem, Barnabas goes to Paul and says, hey, let's go out on another trip. And, and Paul says, fine, but not, not with Mark. Mark was Barnabas's cousin. Paul didn't like him. And the contention, it says in Acts 15, verses 36 to 41, was so sharp that Paul and Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement, the contention was so sharp that they split up. Barnabas took his cousin Mark, and Paul decided on taking his friend Silas. But Paul didn't leave it there. Paul apparently reconciled, came to see a new Mark. We read about this in Colossians 4, verse 10. Colossians 4, verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instruction. So if he comes to you, Welcome him. <clears throat> that was Colossians 4.10. 2 Timothy 4.11. One, I think it's, it wasn't this his last book that Paul wrote. 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Bring him with you. Timothy, bring Mark with you. Because Mark is useful to me for ministry. Isn't that beautiful? That really speaks to my heart. From I want nothing to do with this Mark. No, no, I'm not going to go another trip with him. To bring Mark with you. Peter used Mark as his personal assistant and called him my son. First Peter 5.13 So we have to let each other grow. No matter how badly you've heard about people, the garbage that is being spread by gossips who will have to account for that, Don't be involved in gossip. I have a philosophy my mom taught me when I was about 10 or so that, Philip, if people will talk to you about other people, they will talk, those same people will talk about you as well. Gossip. Whoever you dislike now for any reason, commit that person in prayer to God and hope and pray for growth, but continue to forgive and love them. In so doing, you will grow in love and compassion. That whole passage in 2 Corinthians 5, 15 to 17, verse 17 ends with us being a new creation. Verse 15 and 16 says, quit thinking of people the way they were when you first met them or knew about them. People grow, people change. Then he goes to verse 17, for now we're a new creation. And that's a process. God will perfect us. Complete the process. I have a sermon on God's perfection for us. I hope you hear it. The Holy Spirit will transform us until we're in the image of Christ if we keep our focus on Him. Not on Russia, Ukraine. I pray for the situation there. You bet I do. I watch the news, but after a little bit, I begin to realize it's repetitive, so I wait till the next day, but I, I pray about them. But I want to keep my focus on Yeshua more than ever. More than ever. So, why do we need this? We're talking about why we need to apply all this. Point number three, the offensive, painful times actually help us grow in faith, compassion, and learn to love our enemies. I've already talked about Paul and Mark. I believe God puts us in contact with various situations, various ones, to help everyone, to help us all come to see where we need to grow spiritually. The ones causing the most pain also. 
Start thanking God for them being in your life. You heard me right. When I started thanking God for those five people, Father, they made me see some huge problems I have in my own life. Thank you for that. Praise him in all things, for all things. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Let your request be made known to God in all things with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. No matter how bad it is, will cause more spiritual growth in us as we finally let go. Trust God to do his work. Trust God there's a reason why all these horrible things have happened including death, including suffering, including all kinds of horrible things. If God allowed it, there's a reason for it. Just go ask Job. God allowed all that to happen to Job. Why? Because Job didn't understand that he thought he was so righteous. His perfect righteousness in God's eyes really were filthy rags. Finally, at the end of the book of Job, Job, he says, Now my eye sees you. I shall hear about you. Now I see you. And as I see you, I abhor myself. Can't stand what I see. I repent in sackcloth and ashes. Go to Job 42, I think it is, where he says that. The story of Joseph and his brothers really illustrates this. God meant it for good. You meant it for evil. You sold me as a slave to the Ishmaelites, who sold me to Potiphar, whose wife falsely accused me. And I would spend years in jail. God sent me here, though, and he used you to do it because God had to teach me not to be so self-righteous either, that I had these wonderful dreams full of his own vanity. Joseph had to learn and, and overcome the story of Pharaoh and the Israelites, Esther and Mordecai and Haman, the book of Esther. All of these were turned around for great blessings and victories. Once I started thanking God for those five people, forgiving them from my heart, asking God to bless them, to be kind to them, and not to hold their actions against them. Oh, years before that, I was praying God would let them die. It was only when I turned it around to what it should be that I found God blessing me more and more, and I got tremendous peace and joy from that, replacing the bitterness that I had. So these times show God, point number four, why we need this. These times, the point number three that I just mentioned is that these people come into our lives for a reason. When you're being worked with by God, when you're dealing, I don't mean every time, every person you meet everywhere, but I'm just saying those who have an impact on your life are there for a reason. Point number four, these times show God that we get it, that we see and understand how much he's forgiven us. That's what the whole story of Matthew 18 is all about, the last half of it. I'll include the scripture in the notes because a lot of people in communist countries don't have Bibles. They have access to Internet sometimes. And I want them to see what the scriptures say. And all of you in China and North Korea and all of you in India and the Muslim states and Pakistan, thank you for coming to our site. We love you. God loves you. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for you, and trust him, and bless those who curse you. Point number four is it shows God that we finally get it, that he's forgiven us so much that we've got to forgive anybody who's offended us, whatever it is. Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35, Peter came to him saying, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Yeshua said to him, Jesus said, I do not say seven times, but 70 times seven, 490 times. That was a Hebrew expression, meaning no end to it, Peter. It just goes on and on. Just as God has to forgive you and me daily. Forgive us our trespasses is a daily request because we fail, don't we? Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, discussing the kingdom's way. Now, there's a certain king who wanted to settle his accounts. And as he found, he found this one servant who owed him 10,000 talents. Verse 24, Matthew 18, 24. That is 375 tons worth of silver. Worth millions of dollars. This one 
servant owed the king millions of dollars. He wasn't able to pay that. So his master commanded him be, be sold, his wife, his children, everything he had, so he could get something back for his what, what the guy owed him. The servant fell down, pleaded with him, please, I please, I'll pay it back somehow. Then the master of that servant, verse 27, was moved with compassion and forgave him his debt, forgave the whole millions of dollars. Well, if you know the story, that servant then went to other servants who owed him money, a few thousand dollars, a hundred denarii would be a hundred days wages, demanded that he, they, they pay. This guy, okay, someone owes him a few thousand dollars. He owed the, the king millions and was forgiven. The fellow servant begged him, please, just like he had, but he would not listen to him and threw him into debtor's prison till he should pay the debt. Other servants found out about it, told the king what had happened, the master what had happened, because they were very grieved. And then verse 32, Matthew 18. And then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? His master was angry. This is Yeshua speaking and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Verse 35. So my heavenly Father will also do to each of you if you from his heart, if from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. The point is this, <clears throat> let's not claim we can't forgive someone because what they did was so bad. The lies, the adultery, the offenses, the gossips. That's telling God we have no sense of the enormity of our own sin debt that he forgave us and canceled for each one of us. But when we let go and forgive and let God handle any remaining issues, it releases so much stress. This applies to your feelings about ministers you've left. We have no delight in hearing or talking about sins of televangelists or regular ministers or popes or anybody else. Leave all that to God. Who knows if they've repented and God's forgiven them. But some of us say, my, my sins are so great. I don't know if I can. I a woman, for example, might say, I can forgive the guy who insulted me in front of others, but please don't expect me to ever forgive or have anything to do with that woman who committed adultery with my husband. And she didn't say the word woman. She used a derogatory word. I thought she was my friend. Okay, I'll forgive her, but I can't stand the thought of her. She robbed me of my relationship with my husband. Yeah, my husband too. It's hard for me, frankly, to forgive him all the way too. It's never been quite the same since. Now I can't trust my husband to have female friendships because of her. Does that sound like someone you know? Someone I know. That understandably bitter woman can experience joy if she would just forgive and leave the judgment to God for all that had happened to those who did offensive things to her. All of us have done far worse to God than anything anyone has done to us. So when we forgive others, when it really hurts to, God knows if we're getting it. Number five, we can't fully feel and experience the forgiving grace of our Abba in heaven very well if his children, believers, don't extend that loving grace to sinners who repent. You can't feel the full love force of God unless you watch it happening to you and people are forgiving you and accepting you. Thank God there are people who are doing that. Second Corinthians 2 is all about that. It's a story of the guy who was thrown out of the church and then brought back in and Paul is begging them in Second Corinthians 2. Don't leave him out there. Show him some love. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. We know how Satan works. Don't leave him overly discouraged. Bring him back in. Yeah, that guy doing weird things with his stepmother. Isn't that the whole story? Also the prodigal son in Luke 15. 
and how his father ran out the day God ran. I love that song, the day God ran. Look it up. Or when God ran. I think it's the title of the song. When God ran. It just moves my heart every time. Thank you, Agnes, for in introducing me to that story. That song. Point number six, when we're bitter and hateful. So what I'm saying is, let people understand God's love by you extending it to the worst of sinners because that's who you and I have been. Paul called himself chief sinner. Paul said he was the least of the apostles because I tortured God's children, killed some. One of his accounts, he says, even to kill some of them to death. I guess that's what happens when you kill somebody. They go to death, right? <laughs> Point six, when we're bitter and hateful and unforgiving, we place ourselves in a terrible jail whose bitterness will destroy us. It's another reason. I've said it already, but I just want to point it out again. Receive the release that forgiving will give you, the joy. You'll feel like you've lost a thousand pounds of sin debt binding you. So why, again, do we need to learn to forgive from the heart? If we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. It shows God we understand the kingdom's way and we're part of doing it now. If we don't forgive, we won't fit in the kingdom. It helps us realize that those toxic people were placed into our lives for good reasons. Just as the incidences that, that Job got involved in, that Jacob, Jacob got involved in, losing his son Joseph, he thought, to wild beasts all those years. And Joseph, what he went through. So thank God for these experiences that are preparing you for eternity. It helps us realize all these toxic people were placed in our lives. Like I said, it shows God we get it and we understand we've been forgiven so much more than what we, anyone who's done anything against us is nothing compared to what we've done against God. If you don't think so, by the way, you better repent of not seeing yourself. When we forgive others and bless them, the more deeply experience God's grace. They do, we do, everyone does. So God's called us to extend grace, extend forgiveness, extend reconciliation, extend all of that. And then the bitterness will go away. So how, how are we ever going to get to the point where we can forgive? i got to run through this. Point number one, realize that when you forgive someone, you're not condoning what they did. Sometimes people say they can't forgive because it looks like I'm condoning what they did. No, you're not. No, you're not. Point number two, pray that God help you do it. Believe me, God has been sinned against and rejected billions of times more than we ever have. And God understands. You understands. God will help you. If you step out in faith, just do the next steps. Ask God to change your heart, your unforgiving heart. Ask him to change that. Point number three, stretch. As hard as it is, sometimes you can reach that spot up on the wall if you stretch. Do things you don't think you can do. Just start doing them. You'll find that faith in faith and in prayer. Wow, what we can do, what God will do through us. Stretch. No matter how hard, pray for them. Start asking God to bless them. Even if at first you know it's not totally from the heart. When I first started doing that, it wasn't totally from the heart. But I said, Father, I'm trying. I'm just trying. Please bless them. And change my heart, too. Change my heart. I want it to be sincere. But I'll start by saying the words, bless them, Father. Bless them. Bless their marriage. Bless their income. Bless their health. And then over time, the real you really does want to bless them because God begins to give you that new heart. Romans 12, verses 14 to 21 Here's how it's supposed to work. Romans 14, 12 to 21. Bless those who persecute you. Bless, don't curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. It's not just forgiving. Live in harmony. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't always go... If you're a minister, you'd be all the ministers who would sit together, and, you know, they'd have church dances. All the ministers would sit at the minister's table. I did not. I, I felt, no, I want to go sit with the brethren. I can be with the ministers whenever I want to be. 
Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. There you have it. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Romans twelve seventeen. Be careful to do what's right. Verse 18, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As much as you can. As much as you can, live at peace. Do not take revenge, my friends. Leave room for God's wrath. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And thirsty, give him water, to, and so on. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Isn't that beautiful? It may seem easier just to move on, ignore people who've hurt you, that you've forgiven. No, Romans 12 is saying, live in harmony. Do good for him. Live at peace with him. Don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. So find out some good things you can do to those you're trying to forgive. And reach out in faith and do it. Obviously, if someone is dangerous to you and your family, literally, it could kill you or hurt you, then you have to love them from a distance. But don't just claim that everything everyone does can cause that kind of danger. Work these out. Second Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 19, we've been called to a ministry of reconciliation. God has called us to a ministry of reconciliation, just as we see God through Christ not imputing their trespasses to them, to the world, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. If the person's willing to reconcile, there are one or two that I need to be reconciled with, but they won't reconcile with me. I have tried. I've written notes. I've, I've tried, and I pray, and I want to. So sometimes we can't. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, New Living. Get rid of all bitterness. All of it. All rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Point number four. Point number three on the how was to stretch. Point number four. Analyze how the hate bitterness is hurting you. Decide you don't want that anymore. You want to be rid of that bitterness that's eating you up keeping you from having joy and wanting to be with people. Keeping you, it's making you give up on people. So analyze that. That's point number four. Point number five, whatever you do, work out things privately. Don't do it by gossip. Matthew 18 is very, very clear on that. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7, love is patient, love is kind. This is the love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind. Love doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it doesn't, it's not proud, it's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. If you're keeping record of the dates and times of things that happened, stop it. That's not of God. Love does not delight in evil. It surely doesn't like spreading that evil that about other people. If you're spreading evil about other people, that shows that you delight in evil. Knock it off. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Paul had to experience that kind of forgiveness and love. He had hurt so many people. No wonder God made him a... a, a an apostle to the Gentiles, to get him out of Jerusalem. But Paul, when he looked at the forgiveness of God, Galatians 2.20, I no longer live, I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life that I live is Christ's life living in me. I don't want my own life, he says. Christ died for me, he says in Galatians 2.20, who gave himself for me because he loved me. Make it personal. 
And then you make it personal to the ones you're forgiving. Because I love you, I'm forgiving you. Paul recognized how much hurt he'd caused. He called himself chief sinner, the least of the apostles. He knew, he knew he had to be forgiven a lot. He had to forgive himself as well. And I had to forgive myself. Sometimes that's the hardest one to forgive. But if you have anything against anyone, it means even yourself. Forgive yourself. Move on. Early believers had to learn to trust Paul. And Paul seems to have a hard time really forgiving himself, although he does teach us not to keep looking back. Sometimes Paul did look back, though. I did these horrible things. Don't deserve to be an apostle. The cost of forgiving terrible people who hurt you, will hurt you at first, is always high. It hurts a lot. But then there's such a release of peace and joy. Please do it. Your eternity is at stake. Like I said in the beginning, I think God will bring to your mind these people you have to forgive because he wants you in his kingdom. But if you're aware of people you need to forgive, write that letter you need to write. Write that card you need to write. Make that phone call you need to make. The price of full forgiveness is the ultimate cost, the life of our Creator. Giving up our right to hate someone. This was the value God placed on you and on me was the, 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 the life of His Son. He paid that cost for you. For us to be a part of His family was worth it to Him. And He wants us having that same heart for those who have hurt us so much. Now you put God's price tag on every single person out there and forgive them from your heart too. The cost of forgiving terrible people. But a lot of people, we think of being so terrible. If you really lived in their shoes for a week or so, maybe you'd change your mind. I had no idea that this person has so many side effects from the medications he's taking or she's taking, and that's what makes them irritable. Suicidal, grumpy, hot-tempered, makes them fall asleep while I'm talking to them. I'm serious about that. If you knew the people that you feel are weird and saw the kind of upbringing they had, the kind of father they had, or maybe no father at all. I didn't have a father growing up after age 12. And the first 12 years, he was gone most of the time, trying to earn some support for this missionary mission and Bible school that he had in the Philippines. I grew up without a dad. I really grew up without a mom. She was too busy as a single mom with four kids. Or if you know people were molested as children or people were assaulted or called names because of their race or other things. As we understand this about other people, we're more understanding of why they are what they are. Instead of hating them, how about bringing some sunshine back into their lives? You be the exception. You be the good news they need to hear. If God can forgive the worst of my sins, the worst of yours, and accept people, he wants us to be able to accept that person into our fellowship too. As much as is possible, live at peace, reconcile. Some people don't make it possible. They won't reconcile. God knows you tried. Make sure God knows you tried. God knows you've forgiven from your heart as far as you can go. And now you too will be in God's kingdom if you truly forgive everyone who's offended you. Accept God's grace for us. Now we extend the same grace for others. You'll feel so much better when you do. Do it soon before you forget this. Maybe hear the sermon again if you're struggling with this. Forgiving that ex-husband, that ex-wife, that adulteress, adulterer, that slanderer, that liar. Forgive them. Leave the judgment to God. You know what? I want to see you in the kingdom. And I hope you want to see me in the kingdom, even those of you who hold things against me. Let's be together in the kingdom. Bye-bye for now. May God love you and forgive you. And may God love you and accept you. Father in heaven, we thank you for your wonderful word of forgiveness. 
All year long, Father, I've been talking about your perfect righteousness and perfection that you bestow upon us and your wonderful favor and your grace that even as we still sometimes stumble and fall, it doesn't cut us off from you now that we're your children. Help us to constantly come to you. Help us to extend your mercy, your love, and your grace to everybody else. Yeshua, I bow down my head to you, bow down my life to you. There's another part of me that wants to jump up and just hug you so much. And you, Father, my dear Abba, it's been hard to forgive some people. Help it become easier and easier as we become more and more like your son. Thank you and may you shine upon us. We pray for especially protection for mothers and children and old people in Ukraine. Oh God, please send, please send Yeshua back soon. We thank you. We look forward to everything you have for this world in the coming years. We look forward to the reign of Christ. Thank you in Yeshua's mighty name. Jesus, thank you so much. Amen.